All right, we're getting to the last section here on our notes on the scientific method. We're going to kind of pick off where we pick up where we left off the last time with graphs. Uh, we talked about some of the different types of graphs last time, and and now we're going to show you how to actually make a graph and what parts go where on a graph. So we're really focusing in on this second learning target again. How can you organize and then draw conclusions from the data that's found in a table and a graph? So when you're drawing a graph, remember if you think back to when we did a data table. A data table, the independent variable always goes in the first column. The dependent variable always goes in the next column or columns to the right. Um, you also have to put your independent and dependent variables in a very specific space. Uh, spot on a graph. Um, with a graph, the dependent variable is always going to go here on the y-axis, and the independent variable is always going to go here on the x-axis. Okay, and uh, a friend of mine um, a few years back um, taught me a way to remember this that I thought was just great. I I never learned it before, and I, ever since then I thought, this is awesome. How you can remember where to put your independent and dependent variable is to remember the terms dry, mix. Okay? The dry stands for dependent, The dependent variable. It's the responding variable because it's going to respond to the independent variable and it's always on the y axis. Okay, sorry, that's supposed to be an A. Okay, mix stands for the manipulated. I'll have to write that down there. <laughs> That's the manipulated variable. It's the independent variable. And it's on the x axis. Okay? You can write it somewhere where you have a little more space, but <laughs> I kind of had to squeeze that in there. But whenever you're making a data table, I, I mean a uh, graph, you have to include the title. You have to label both the x and the y axes. Okay, so make sure you get both of those labeled here. See how we have time here and height? You must include units. Notice how this didn't have it. We don't know for time if it's minutes, seconds, days, years. So you always need to, in parentheses, include your units. Same with height. What were they measuring in? Were they measuring in millimeters? Were they measuring in meters? Were they measuring in inches? We need to have a unit here if possible, okay? And then you would include a key or a legend if you had multiple data sets that you were all putting all on one, on, on one graph. So if you had to do like three different sets of data, then you would have to do a key or a legend off to the side that would, you know, tell me that a straight line means that, a dashed line means that, and you tell me what those mean, okay? So you always have to have that title at the top as well, so don't forget to include a title up here. So we are going to practice with um, making a graph from a piece of data in a data table. So we showed this before when we were looking at data tables. And remember, we said, gosh, this thing is missing something, this data table. Well, it's missing a title, isn't it? And so let's start by just putting a title on this uh, data table, because then we can use the same title for our graph as well. So again, they're comparing um, the basalt melting temperature in degrees Celsius at different depths in kilometers. So one of the ways we said you could do this is just say um, your dependent variable, which is this, versus your independent variable, which is this. So basalt melting temperature 
in degrees Celsius at different depths. I'll put kilometers behind it. Okay? So but the basalt melting temperature in degrees Celsius at different depths. That's what this table right here is showing us. So let's set up our graph. Now, what type of graph are we going to do? Because that's the, one of the first things you have to ask yourself. What type of graph? Is it going to be a line graph, a bar graph, a pie graph, a scatter plot? Well, we're comparing two different sets of data here. So the best thing uh, to do here would be to do a line graph because we are comparing two sets of data to see if one influences the other. And so, um, again, your independent variable always goes on the um, uh, x-axis, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> uh, remember, dry mix. And so x, um, the axis is where the independent variable goes. And so you can see here, it looks like we can... Um, if we start at zero here, if we want to go by 25, 50, 75, 100, 125, 150, we can go that way. 25, 50, 25, 50, okay. And then the next one we want to look at, okay. We, we start here at uh, 1,100 is our lowest and 1,600 is our highest. We don't always have to start at uh, zero uh, on the axis when we start there. So I'm going to start and, and just go by, um, go with 1,000 first of all, 1,100, 1,200. 1,300, 1,400, 1,500, 1,600, and do it that way. Okay? Um, and so, at zero, I have 1,100, and so I'm just going to put that right here. And then at 25, I have 1,160. So I'll say that's about right here. And then at 50, it's 1250. Let's pull right halfway through. And at 100, notice I don't have any data point at 75. I'm going over to 100. It's at 1400. And at 150, it's at 1600 up here. And then I would just like that. Okay, am I done? No, I am not. I need to have a specific title. Do I need to come up with a whole new one? I do not. I can put one, use the same one from over here. Basalt temperature degrees Celsius at different depths. Maps in kilometers. Okay, am I finished? No, I am not. Remember, we have to label both of our axes. So the x axis is our independent variable. We have our label right here. We don't have to think of it up on our own. So we put depth and we have our units in kilometers. And then here is our dependent variable. So I'm going to tilt this and Switch it is the basalt melting temperature and that's in uh, degrees Celsius. So I have units there too. Now I have this all done. Okay, I have all the different things labeled. I have a specific title. I've plotted my data points out. From there we would look at it and draw conclusions from it. Was our hypothesis supported? And so that's why we have to always 
you know, include data in our data tables and graphs because we want to be able to see, did it support our original hypothesis? Uh, if, if your hypothesis is supported, great. Then you have to see if you can repeat the tests and get the same results. If you do, you communicate those results to others. Can other people repeat your tests and do the exact and get very similar results? Okay, that's what science is all about. Now, obviously, not all the time is your hypothesis supported. So you might just have to do uh, a, an alternative uh, hypothesis. Maybe yours wasn't supported, so now we got to go back and change and come up with a different one. Maybe you need to do some new tests. Uh, at, at any re re rate, you're always going to try to repeat your tests several times to see if you get the same results or not, first of all, to, before you throw out your hypothesis. Um, because something may have just gone wrong, and we call those experimental errors. We're human. Sometimes we measure incorrectly. Sometimes something just goes wrong in the experiment. So we always want to record those errors that may have occurred that may have contributed to the data that we're finding, and that helps us in our analysis a little bit better. From there, after your conclusions, to see whether you've supported your hypothesis or not, then we have sometimes have a... Uh, section called the discussion section. That's where we'll talk about what kind of improvements based on what we found out in our experiment. Is there some things that went wrong that maybe we can improve on next time? Let's talk about it. What's the importance of this experiment? The information you found out about, it, why is it important? How can we apply it to our own life or to the world outside, you know, to the everyday world? Um, that's the importance of experimentation is to see how can it help or affect you or those around you. And then what are some maybe future studies or related studies that you could do related to this? Those are usually what are all included um, in a lab report. And that's part of that last step of communicating your results. Usually we are going to be doing this in, in class. Um, a lot of, you might have, to, I might have you read some examples of scientific papers or journals when you're doing some of your background research. That's what somebody else has communicated from what they have done with their research. Uh, you may see posters up in the hallway. My genetics kids do uh, posters, um, research posters. That's how they present their data when they are done. Um, and oftentimes you might do a PowerPoint presentation. You've probably had to do those in other classes too for other communicating your results from other types of studies that you have done. And if you have a set of hypotheses that have survived extensive testing, sometimes they can become what we call a theory. And that just explains some phenomena of the natural world. Um, uh, when we get to the evolution unit, uh, we'll be talking about Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. That's a um, uh, that theory, that's an explanation that has survived many, many, many people testing the same thing and getting similar.